Hello, British Rati. I'm Jazz Glati, and welcome to this interference cast. I've got Dr. Paul Goodman from Philadelphia, USA. He runs this amazing community called Dental Nachos, just a great resource of positivity and dentistry, and so much help and courses for dentists all over the world. It'll be so obvious to you from our conversation, his enthusiasm and his great analogies and way of communicating. I'm just a huge fan of Paul Goodman, uh, and I love the theme that we discuss. You know how dental school let you down. Now, please, please, please. I have so many colleagues that work at schools and I'm well connected with dental schools. Listen, we are not bashing dental schools. Okay, we are not bashing dental schools. We are merely just raising a few real world points that perhaps, perhaps in some areas of dentistry and maybe even clinical experience that there was a little bit of a shortfall. Now it's okay. It's all right. We get it. We understand why. Okay. There's only so much dental school can fulfill. And it takes you back to um, being on an orthodontic clinic, and one of the tutors uh, goes to me. She goes to me, Jazz. Did you learn to drive before passing a driving test or after passing a driving test? And I'd only recently got my license. And I was like, Well, I think afterwards, because I still really don't know how to drive yet properly. Uh, so it's it's just same in dentistry. Okay. Dental school will give you that certificate. Will give you that license to drill. But Actually, how you communicate with patients, how you can formulate really good treatment plans that are appropriate, how you can uh, get your hand skills to where you want them to be, where they need to be—that takes time, devotion, mentorship, and it is universal that we have to learn that once we qualify. And that kind of process is only enhanced and fast-tracked through good mentorship and being around good people in dentistry. And let me tell you what, Dr. Paul Goodman is a good person in dentistry. Let's listen to the interview. Paul Goodman, Dr. Paul Goodman from the USA, from the Dento, from the Nachoverse. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing awesome, Jazz. Really thrilled to be talking with you. I love this topic. I love that you're out sharing knowledge. I mean, all of your listeners and listeners of podcasts everywhere. I was listening to a podcast in the walkover should just be grateful that we have so much content to learn literally while we're walking around, getting coffee in our ears. So I really, really admire what you do. Man, I have to just point out for those of you who are listening right now, not watching, because this also goes up on YouTube, as you guys know, but those listening right now, I've got Paul in front of me. He is uh, doing a wonderful job, professional mic. He's got his nacho hoodie. I've got my protrusive hoodie uh, and he's on the walking treadmill. And I've also got my walking treadmill, but I'm not using it. But already that's a that's a huge similarity I found there. Nice. The other similarity I found uh, is between us is you having this amazing community, the Dental Nacho community, which I want everyone to, to check out and, and what a wonderful job you're doing. Your community Thanks. is just so much energy, so much uh, so much, so much activity going on. So I can only aspire for my community to, to become like yours one day. So it's uh, brilliant. Uh, and the other thing is uh, the, the kind of things that we're talking about is A, trying to uplift our profession, profession yeah. trying to really get everyone thinking of the positive, but be being down to earth and actually reflecting on, on dental school as an experience. So that's yeah. very much the, the topic we're covering today. Uh, just tell us for those people perhaps in the UK and the world who haven't heard of uh, the nacho verse before, dental nachos, how that came to be uh, sure. and, and what, what you stand for. Uh, well, like most good ideas, I have my wife to thank for the name. Uh, I have myself to thank for my obsession slash passion with Mexican food. So I was a <laughs> restaurant server at 19, 24 years ago for a corporate Mexican place in New Jersey. I learned so much there about systems, working as a team, how to treat customers. So it was a wonderful experience. I always loved. I also was a little, I was I was the kid, Jazz, that when you, this is how it works in the U.S. I don't know about the U.K. I don't know how to have some, but when you sat down at a Mexican restaurant, restaurant when I was a kid, they would immediately give you free chips and salsa. So I love that you could have food before you have the food, right? There's a South Park joke on that. So I thought to myself, I want to make a group. I do a lot of different things. I'm a dentist. I own two practices. I'm a speaker. I'm a broker. Uh, I have a, like a lot of toppings. So let's name it dental nachos. And then really the metaphor and the analogy, you know, if you, if you do get a dental nachos swag, we'll send it to you. Someone's going to say, oh, hey, Jazz, what's dental nachos, right? They'll say it at the gym. They'll stay at a coffee shop, say it's like a Mr. Rogers neighborhood for dentists because dentists need help being nice to each other. They're nice to patients. And I always say dentists are very good with patients, not as good with people because dental school makes us very, very weird. I really believe this, Jazz. <laughs> When my friends, who I'm friends with today, were doing finance and business and HR, we were in a basement burning ourselves with wax trying to make a tooth. And I think that we didn't develop these skills ages 22 to 26, 23 to 28, 
where social development skills, like my best friend works in finance in New York. When he was 25, Jess, he was standing with a glass of wine at 11 p.m. at some sort of networking event next to a mm-hmm. guy who made $10 million and his boss said, you got to talk to that guy. So they had to figure that out. So that's where not just came about, a place where we can learn, share, have fun, work on our business, have uncomfortable conversations with respect, buy things. You know, I have made it kind of like a 24-7 virtual exhibit. We have sponsors, so you don't have to buy anything, like a free park, but you can if you want. So that's the nacho verse for, for you. Well, I'll put the link for everyone to join. So if you haven't checked out the Dental Nachos group and their community and the website, you must check it out. So you can obviously hear uh, or watch Paul's Paul's, uh, enthusiasm and his passion and the way he explains things is is just brilliant. I'm a huge fan. And I read a lot of your stuff and I watch a lot of your stuff. And the common theme, uh, which is going to be the theme of the podcast we're covering today is how dental school let us down. Now, I hope that you're in agreement that this we're not making this to, I don't know, have a uh, hold up a grudge against dental schools or or, or or try and point blame finger at them. There are certain circumstances that dental schools have to, you know, be complicit with that leads to the kind of downfalls. But really, yeah. I think the I hope you agree, Paul, that the the reason for for doing this is to make essentially dentists realize that. We have those shortcomings, but what we can do after dental school to to make up for it. Would you agree for that? I, to- I totally agree. It's such a great point. I-, I get known a little bit as being, I say, just be nice, J- JBN, which is about being nice to your colleagues about if somebody decides to do a crown when you would have done a large filling, don't call them the worst dentist in the world. Don't make fun of them. But JBR is just be real. And being real is taking a look at what's happening to in the dental school world, taking a look at the lack of fundamental skills that dentists are getting in dental school for surviving and thriving. Um, I'm a big, I I, I have to say, I had the most amazing parents. They're not alive right now, but they're amazing parents. But they lied to me, Jazz. You want to know why they lied to me? Yes, absolutely. Because they, there was this theme, still with parenting, I have two awesome children. If you work hard enough, you can do anything you want, right? If you work hard enough, you can be anything you want to be. Well, I wanted to play professional basketball in the NBA. And that dream did not come true. So I joke with my par- <laughs> joke about that with my parents. So what I share is if you played basketball and you went to basketball school for four years, and they only taught you about dribbling, never taught you about passing, and say, when are you going to learn about passing? You're going to figure that out later. Well, when you get into the game in the real world and you don't have passing skills or shooting skills or playmaking skills or defensive skills or what to do when the ball gets turned over, you become, your morale goes down, your ability to help patients go down. So I just really try to be a voice in a kindly annoying way. One of my things is I kindly annoy people. My wife might say I regularly annoy people. (laughs) But one of my best friends, Dr. Todd Fleischman, he's been on our podcast. He's a teacher, speaker for us. He's done Coist. He's done Spear. He's an amazing dentist, but even more amazing human being. Early on in Dental Nachos, I kindly annoyed him to become a speaker because I said, you have to share this talent, Todd. And he goes, I don't want to do it. And I say, I don't care. We're going to kindly annoy you to do it. So he's always said, the more Paul Goodman kindly annoys you, the less annoyed you'll be yourself. Excellent. I love that basketball analogy. And I think there's so many different ways that we can run with that analogy. And one way we've already touched upon is the communication aspect, like, you know, being in that little basement waxing up compared to uh, <laughs> yeah. our, our our peers doing other subjects were getting d- different kinds of real world experiences, uh, more interactive with people who are not just in their own sort of, um, um, you know, um, economy, I guess. Right. So it's great to, 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 to draw that um, comparison. But th- let's draw in on another tangent here, which is is the clinical skills itself. Like you, you obviously in US, the tuition fees are astronomical compared to the yeah. UK. Uh, and one of the themes I get, uh, I get is that okay, I just paid all this money and so much debt, yet I only did X number of procedures. Such now in point. the UK. I want to learn from you because we do have an episode about comparing UK and US, but I just want to learn from you. Like in the UK nowadays, obviously because the pandemic has affected it as well, a dentist can graduate having done one molar root canal yep. or maybe two or three crowns. So how does that compare to, you know, you're, you're very so much in, in sadly, tune with the... the, the sadly, the, it's very much the same. Even worse, some, some schools are doing none. So I will use another analogy. I've read a lot about analogies for teaching. So over this summer, we had a party for my seven-year-old at a place called Primp and Play. It was where all these girls and guys can get, uh, young kids can get stuff done. So I'll just use an example. When I bought pizza for that party and there was 12 kids 
if I only bought enough pizza for eight kids, I'm gonna have four disappointed kids, right? So using this analogy with dental schools, if they accept more students than what they have clinical procedures for those students to learn, they are literally going to mess up their lives. They're literally going to cause emotional problems because right now they are giving degrees to dental students. One of the things I thought during the pandemic, Jazz, and I don't know if Scotland did this, but as soon as the pandemic happened, I said they should stop taking dental students for a year, skip a whole year of taking students. Now, I do not know the economics of higher education. I do not understand if that makes places shut down. But what I saw was the people graduating during the pandemic through no fault of their own got even less experience than what was already a problematic experience when I went. My dad was a dentist who I worked with for 11 years before he passed away. He said to me, Paul, private practice isn't going anywhere. Do a GPR, get as many skills as you can. You can never learn too much early. But what's unfair, Jazz, is a GPR or AGD, that's extra training for the US, Mm -hmm. Dental students are paying for four years of school to get a degree in general dentistry that if you want to use an analogy like drinks at a bar, it's watered down, it's debilitated, it's not what they paid for. And I believe that this is going to cause an enormous crisis in our industry. I believe it's going to cause a mental health crisis. I believe it's going to cause a practice transition crisis. I think it's, if you are a dentist on earth who's working, unless you're retired, it's gonna affect you. And even if you're retired, you still need a good dentist, right? So I think these awesome young students, uh, through no fault of their own, and also what I think is cool about dentistry is people start when they're 35, so they're not necessarily always young in age, right? They have been misled as to what the dental school experience is gonna provide them to be able to use their career successfully. So how, how can we, what advice can we give to that young dentist who maybe has just come out of dental school and they realize that they're, you know, doing a cramp operation makes them nervous. Doing extractions uh, scares them because they did not get the, the backup of the procedures, didn't get the mentorship that they deserved. And they, and all, all that while during dental school, they, you, you touched on this, they had mental health challenges nervous breakdowns because they were trying to, oh my God, am I going to qualify? Am I going to graduate right. because I only have X number of canals on, on the system? So they, they finally right. got through that. They're on the other side. How can we give them some uh, nacho, uh, dental nacho, I don't know, put, throw I some it. salsa on them or whatever? <laughs> one of the um, signs in my office, one of quotes is, everything that matters needs a system and everything matters, but always make the best decision in the moment. So you may have a system that a patient has to pay ahead of time. That's your system. But Millie comes in and she's a great patient and she's had a personal crisis and for whatever reason, she didn't bring her credit card. Well, maybe in that moment, it's best to let Millie go, right? I'm just using an example. So back to your dental, your dental graduating dental student. Now, this is one of these things. So I've been alive for 44 years and I've been through a lot of different nutritional themes in the US, right? The processed food used to be good for you. Now it's not good. Uh, I mean, it was never good for you, but they made it seem like it was good. Eat whole mm -hmm. foods. And this, but have you heard that, like, there's such thing as good fats, right? When I'm in the 30s, like, good fats, avocado, right? So I'm like, yes. I guess I could eat as – you could eat good fats to be less fat, let's say. So back to uh -huh. these dental students. That's uncomfortable. For someone who grew up in the 80s, I still don't feel totally comfortable when they say, oh, you can eat these good fats. It feels weird to me, right? So when you have a lot of debt – I know it feels weird. You must invest more money and time into stuff that really matters. One of my friends, Lincoln Harris, who runs Ripe, you should interview him. He is an 80,000 member I Facebook. I already movie. have, Paul, and he's the one oh. who introduced me to you, believe it or oh, not. Right. So there we awesome. are. <laughs> so Link and I spent time in Philadelphia. We think a lot alike. Link is a phenomenal dentist, much, 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 much higher clinical level dentist than me. So for example, Link has put together this program where anyone from around the world can learn in their operatory, and maybe, I don't know what it costs, so maybe I'm saying too much or too little, but let's just say that's $10,000 for a year. But what I'm saying is, okay, $20,000 for a year, you gotta say, hey, I just spent 500, 600, 700,000 on dental school, 300, four years. I know I don't feel like doing this, but these are the tips, these are the tools from Lincoln Harris that's going to help me. And I have to figure out a way to invest. Maybe I ask parents, maybe I take out a loan because what happens is if you miss out on fundamental dribbling, passing and shooting skills early, you may never learn that. So that's one way. Then the other way, I'm a big fan of utilizing free resources. I use them in through podcasts is to really invest in how to learn to talk to people, 
how to learn to communicate. One of the be- I, I do like three things well, Jazz, but one of them is being a public speaker. I've done training. I spoke at the DEO in front of 300 people. When I got off stage, people go, you're such a natural up there, which is ridiculous. No one's a natural at getting up in front of 300 people. I put in so much training and so much time. There's a, there's a, on YouTube, it's been viewed millions of times, How to Speak by Patrick Winston. You can put it in the show notes. How to Speak by Patrick Winston, okay. an MIT professor. I listen to it before every big speech I give. So it's not about public speaking. It's about getting your point across to people. So who do young dentists have to do that with Jess? Their patients in the operatory, their team, the dentist that owns the practice. So I always talk about your dental core are your clinical hand skills, your mind skills, and your word skills. So if you're a new dentist, use a Lincoln Harris type thing to work on those clinical skills, but combine it with both your business skills and your communication skills. That is fantastic. So we covered two key, uh, key themes already, which is the lack of uh, clinical skills and how although the cost of dental school could be astronomical, especially in, in your side of the pond, uh, it is about investment so that you can yeah. come out of the other side uh, and, and make up for the shortcomings, I guess. Right. Uh, let's talk about the fact that the techniques that we were taught at dental school, they are very frustrating because they're not cutting edge. And then when you come out of dental school, the first thing that my mentors taught me is, okay, forget everything they taught you at dental school. This is actually how you do it. So in this world where we navigate, and in, in like you touched on already, one dentist might say, okay, do a crown. Another dentist might say, oh, that dentist is the worst dentist in the world because he did a crown, something that needed a restoration. We should be nice, which I, I really appreciate that, that sentiment. But how do you know how, you know, who's right, who's wrong? How do you know which philosophy to align? Should you go spear, should you go panky, should you go coice? There's so much noise. How does one navigate through this noise? Because when you come out, you had limited experiences and what you were using wasn't cutting edge. So good, I want to point out. So John Coyce is one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, when I was a resident, I sat in the Hinman in Atlanta. I heard him, I love how he teaches, you know, patients don't accept solutions to problems they do not have. Um, what happens if you do nothing? I had the honor of being on a stage with him, which is just a funny story. So he was like my idol, I love him. He didn't know anything about me. But I had dinner wow. with him the night before, and he's such a classy individual that when he opened up this speech as the headliner first, he goes, you know, I'm Dr. John Coyce. I'm going to talk about occlusion. Dr. Uh, Dr. Jason Olitsky is going to talk about aesthetic dentistry. Jason Olitsky is very good, very good in Florida. Gary Takis is going to talk about practice management. And Paul Goodman is going to talk about nachos. And I just thought that was such a funny <laughs> moment for me. And I, I, I love that. But Coyce said this so well at that event. One dentist treatment plan of helping a patient is another dentist malpractice. And he says, we have such bad standards and it's messing mm. up everything. So what I would share is if you're not learning, I always say dental school teaches my space of dentistry and then you get out and no <laughs> one has a MySpace account. And people go, oh my God, that's I mean, brilliant. I don't love this. this. This I think is just kooky talk jazz. When people go, you have to know how something was done even though we don't do it anyway that way anymore, I think it's the dumbest statement ever, right? The most dumb statement ever. You don't know how, you do not need to know how MySpace works. You can know MySpace was an original social media thing and it morphed into Facebook and it went out of business. So like you don't need to know how to invest and cast a gold crown. It's pointless. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of time. If you want to know gold was done, and maybe sometimes people use it occasionally, but you're not going to have, I always have understood, why in dental school would they take people who didn't know anything and let them play with this thing that spun around and like shot out fire, right? I don't know if you did that in your <laughs> dental school, but we didn't have this. Sure. So what dental students and new dentists need to do is just to embrace whatever they, they are learning in the real world and strive to discard stuff that doesn't make sense. Keep things that do make sense. There's dental students right now learning how to prepare a crown in a really great way at dental school, right? So keep that. There's also dental students doing the fourth reset of a denture or an altered cast RPD, which is likely gonna be discarded. And I just have to share, it's a very, very difficult thing. But strive to hang out with dentists who are doing the up-to-date things in the real world and embrace that technology. 
And I would say, get um, to, to add on to that, get exposure, get out there, shadow other dentists, because yeah. you will get your eyes open to what is out there. Yeah. And then you'll be able to to figure out, okay, what is it that, that really is your calling within dentistry? Um, I mean, one of the many episodes that. and themes that we covered is finding your niche. And I, and I, I just know you're going to have a, a good analogy or an answer for this. Uh, if, if you were to give a dentist, any dentist, I don't care how experienced they are, some advice about find out what is gonna, their happy place in dentistry. Any ideas in terms of how that dentist can figure out what it is that they can uh, really make their thing? Right, so I'll have a good one. It's the Goldilocks thing, right? So Goldilocks said, this is too hot, this is too cold, this is just right, right? The only way for you to do this, like Gary V said, is to taste test a lot of things. In dentistry, what I would encourage someone to do right now, wherever they are in their career, but especially a dental student or associate, is to walk into dental offices and go up to the front desk and say, hi, my name is Dr. Paul Goodman. I'm a dentist in this area. I would love to learn more about what dentistry is like in this area. Could I take the practice owner out to lunch? Could I take the practice owner out to lunch? If you do bring cookies for the front desk or fruit, if you do this, magic will happen. Because I already test, test, tested this. A dental student did this and one time was offered a job on the spot by doing that. Wow. I mean, I, can totally, we, I totally get it. We're such a cave mentality, but it's not about jobs. It's about seeing how other people operate. So maybe someone takes every insurance and that's for you. Maybe someone takes no insurances. I'm friends with Jason Smithson, amazing dentist, one of the best on earth, just like a link. I don't, I don't know exactly how dentist, you know, the UK works, but seems like either people can pay out of pocket or kind of be in this government funded you know, plan. He's not in that. Maybe there's merit to doing that. So go and see how other dentists practice in a kind, humble, and genuine way. Because I want to share this with you. If anybody lets you into their dental office to watch them, they're doing you the favor. They are going out of their way. When someone comes to watch me, it's more stressful. I have to work slower. I have a stranger in the office, but I'm doing it because I want to showcase what dentistry can be like. So if you go and ask, you're going to get people say we're not interested. You're going to get people hanging up on you. But if you go into dental offices and just say that, my name is Dr. Paul Goodman. I'm a dentist in this area. I'm a dental student. I would love to know what dentistry is like. Could I take the practice owner out to lunch? Just say those things and magic will happen. Well said, and I totally agree. And I think the opportunities are all out there. And sometimes dentists, we're shy to ask, oh, what if I get rejected? It's like, you know, when you're to be giving treatment plans, oh, what if I get rejected? So I'm not going to be comprehensive. If you don't ask, you don't get. And I think the you have way more to lose by not messaging your peers that you respect, that you can learn so much from, uh, than getting a rejection. It doesn't matter. I think I totally agree with you. What a great way to do it, the way you suggested. Thanks. I mean, you just made now, a good point, and I'll just add just a, yeah. a one minute of value. So mm. Lincoln Harris is amazing at talking to patients and then amazing at doing dental care. I learned a lot about implants during my career, but I do not do the clinical things that he does. But both of us talk a lot about how to communicate with patients. And my secret to getting high case acceptance is one sentence. My secret to getting high case acceptance is one sentence. I do not care what the patient chooses in any way. I care about delivering the menu. I care about saying salsa, guac, nachos, which one sounds best to you. I say, even if you decide to do nothing, we can still be friends, Jazz. People laugh, right? And it comes off of my body. It comes off of my energy that I do not care in the kindest way what they choose, but I care a lot about presenting all the options to them in a genuine and patient-friendly way. Phenomenal value there, uh, and I love the whole again menu. You almost you might have missed it if you didn't. The way you said menu and the, the the way you backed it up with the food cho choices that is an amazing way to relate it, and I love that. Um, Paul, the mic is over to you, my friend. Do you think there's any other major point that we haven't covered yet that we should uh, d d to finish on in terms of how Den School let us down, uh, let us down, but how we can overcome that, and what's the best way to overcome that? Uh, yeah, so one of my one of the best things people have a phone and they have notes in their phone. And if you look at mine, I'm sh I'll show you mine in a sec. If you look at mine, <laughs> you'll see like 83 notes started because whenever I have an idea or something I want to remember, I use my notes. So what I would encourage people to do in dental school is to, and this is one of my consultants, to make a keep doing, a start doing, and a stop doing list. And whenever you find something, like maybe you listen to this podcast, and I don't tell people, Jazz, that their teeth fail. I say they're time for their teeth to retire. So maybe you have mm -hmm. this thing and say, Paul Goodman says, don't say fail, say retired. Okay? Don't say that. You put that in the start doing. Stop doing might be, I saw my dental school instructor 
share with me that if I don't do this this way, I'm not going to be successful and it's some sort of technique from the 1950s, say, I'm not going to do it that way. You could still be nice to the dental school instructor. You can still be kind. And then start doing, right? I'm going to find out about Link's courses. I am going to find out about how to buy practice. One thing that dental students do is they wait until it's too late to take action. So prepare and aware yourself early. This is your career. This is what you're going to be doing for 30 years. One of my good friends, Laura Brenner, she runs Dentisting Side Gigs. She retired from dentistry after 10 years, and she said, I feel like dentistry is a career you marry, and buying a practice is like having a baby with the career you marry. And I've said that numerous times. The practice purchase is a three-year-old child that never grows up. I have a three-year-old in my house. <laughs> it's part awesome, all the time insane. So my message to you is there's four decisions in your life. Finding a job, career, finding a job, buying a practice, hiring an associate, selling your practice. Figure out how to be successful in each one of those words. So that's kind of my parting thoughts. I love that. And I think I've enjoyed the high energy, high impact value uh, of, of, of this chat with you. Uh, please tell us, for those listening right now who haven't come across Nachos, what's the best way to connect into the Nachoverse? So I'm a huge sports fan from I think. So I created an ESPN style website for dentalnachos.com. So you know I do. I'm really really proud and I'm really thrilled to be on this. When I do a, a online CE course, I call it Nacho CE on TV. I get dentists from India and England, which is great, right? So I have a text code for anyone who wants to get a free CE course. It's text Nachos to two one five five four three six four five four. But sometimes, Jazz, it doesn't work with their cell phone there. So they can just email Nacho Gift to salsa at dentalnachos.com. So if anyone emails Nacho Gift to salsa at dentalnachos.com, we'll send them back a free resource. They can go to dentalnachos.com. I love meeting new dentists from all over Earth and so grateful that you had me on your podcast. Amazing. Well, I'll make sure I get that link on there so people have a direct link to get to that e email and that phone number. Uh, it's definitely worth it, guys. And also join the Facebook community. Uh, so much positivity. You know, there's so much negative stuff, especially in the, in the, in the UK, Paul, and, you know, on the dental groups. There's a lot of negativity. But when I, every time I see something from Nachos, there's always positivity galore. So uh, hey. do join that, guys, and, and check out okay. Paul's amazing content. Uh, and it's great to connect with you, Paul. Uh, I've been following your stuff, so it's nice to have you on the show. And uh, our mutual friend, uh, Lincoln, his, his ears must be burning. Uh, yeah. is, have a lovely day, my friend. And thank you so much once again you for coming too. on the show. Thanks, yes. Hope you enjoyed that little interference cast with Paul. Listen, if you want to catch any of the links that he said, any of the resources, just read the show notes. And you're like, well, how do I read the show notes? Well, if you're unfamiliar, it's going to be in the, the YouTube description. Or if you're listening on, on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you should be able to, to click and expand. It's not so easy on Spotify. It's much easier on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. I'm not the biggest fan of Google Podcasts, by the way. They, they kind of had um, hidden a lot of my episodes, basically. So the best way to consume it is protrusive.co.uk. Uh, the app, which should be out by now at the time of recording this. So the app will have all the links easily for you to, to click onto. Uh, and of course, the Protrusive website. Anyway, really appreciate you uh, watching, listening all the way to the end. And I'll catch you in the next one.